This is Dr. Tracy Zhang with Oral Pathology Videos for the Dental Hygienist. Today we will discuss the process of inflammation and repair. Remember that the video lessons for Chapter 2 are available at our Oral Pathology website on Weebly. Be sure to watch the video lessons on that site and take notes. Study your chapter text for Chapter 2 and make flashcards on all the conditions listed in the synopsis at the end of the chapter, as well as practice identifying photos of oral conditions from the PowerPoints from Chapters 1 and 2 and the practice PowerPoint that I will post on Sakai for Chapter 2. Our first exam is the third week of September, and now is the time to begin studying. Let's begin with inflammation. Write down what you already know about inflammation. Pause the video and resume when you are finished. There are five basic signs of inflammation, otherwise known as the five cardinal signs of inflammation. These are swelling, redness, or erythema, which is the term we will use, heat, pain, and loss of function. You can see from the picture that many of these cardinal signs are evident in periodontal disease. Many of the conditions that we will look at in Chapter 2 will involve the inflammatory process, whether acute, as shown in some of the pictures later, or chronic inflammation, as shown here, especially chronic conditions that involve hyperplasia and proliferation of cells. We'll focus first on inf acute inflammation, which generally occurs in response to an injury of some sort. Note that in your textbook on page 36, there is a box in the lower left corner that lists the inflammatory events. First, your blood vessels constrict very briefly and then dilate. The blood vessel permeability increases and a low protein plasma called transudate leaves the microcirculation. Then the blood flow slows down as the blood thickens in that area. White blood cells that I call WBCs begin to make their way to the blood vessel walls. This process is called margination. Then they line up against the blood vessel wall. We call this pavementing. Then the blood vessel walls become permeable and the WBCs leave the blood vessel to migrate to the site of injury. At the site of injury, the WBCs ingest or phagocytize foreign substances or necrotic tissue. All of these events lead to the five cardinal signs of inflammation that we mentioned earlier, swelling, redness, heat, pain, and loss of function. When the white blood cell responds to an injury, the neutrophil, or polymorphonuclear leukocyte, is the first responder. Just like an EMT responding to an ambulance call, the neutrophil is generally first on the scene. Then the monocytes arrive and transform into macrophages. Both of these cells phagocytize foreign invaders heavily. There are many other factors involved in inflammation, such as the biochemical mediators, also called inflammatory mediators. These involve the kinin system that increase vasodilation of the microvasculature and increases permeability of the blood vessels. The clotting mechanism, which stops bleeding, and also forms a fibrous network, or mesh, which helps seal the site and provide a framework to rebuild new tissue. And last, the complement system, which activates mast cells, is also involved in cytolysis, opsonization, or marking cells to be phagocytized, and much more. When an event leads to more than a localized acute inflammatory event, we call it systemic inflammation. 
The clinical signs of systemic inflammation are fever, leukocytosis, or an increase in the number of white blood cells, lymphadenopathy, and an increase in C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a blood level marker of systemic inflammation. Normal levels of C-reactive protein average about 10 milligrams per liter while elevated levels of C-reactive protein can be as high as 100 milligrams per liter. Our next topic is regeneration and repair. Regeneration occurs when tissue damage has been very slight, often not even breaking all the way through the epithelium. When the body heals in regeneration, there is a complete removal of all products of inflammation and a full return to function. If there has to be an injury, this is by far the best outcome. Repair is what the body does to fix the damaged tissue when a complete return to normal or regeneration is not possible and is the final defense mechanism. The body clears out all necrotic or dead tissue and replaces the damaged or destroyed tissue. If the area healed with a scar, keep in mind that scar tissue is not functional tissue, although it does seal the injured area. There are three basic phases of repair, including inflammation, proliferation, and maturation. As you research this area, some sites will note that hemostasis, or blood clotting, is part of the inflammation process. It's generally the very first event that begins. But most sites categorize hemostasis under inflammation. I placed a video of this process on our Oral Pathology Weebly site for you to watch a more thorough explanation of this process so we won't go into that now. But remember that the three phases of repair overlap a great deal. And there are many factors that speed healing or delay healing. A typical repair timeline, as mentioned in your textbook, involves clotting, clot formation, or hemostasis that begins immediately, as we just mentioned. By day one, or often much sooner, acute inflammation has begun in which the neutrophils, or first responders, arrive and begin to phagocytize foreign invaders and necrotic tissue. During days two through seven, the monocytes emigrate to the site of injury and change into macrophages. They also phagocytize invaders and necrotic tissue as well as mark some cells for destruction by a process called opsonization. As monocyte or macrophage activity increases, the neutrophil activity decreases. By day 7, all other factors being normal, the surface has healed and granulation tissue remodeling is still going on. By day 14, often the remodeling phase is complete proliferation has completed, and tissues begin to mature. This maturation process, and even the earlier phases of healing, may take many weeks depending on other factors that could impair healing. Bacterial infection, tissue destruction and necrosis, hemorrhage or hematoma, excessive movements of the injured tissue, and a poor blood supply such as that seen in diabetic patients, are just a few of the factors that could delay healing. Systemic factors include poor nutrition, the patient's immune suppression, such as patients undergoing chemotherapy or taking steroids, or those with immune diseases, such as HIV, as well as metabolic syndromes like diabetes and renal failure, all affect the timeline of healing. Often, we'll see diabetic patients with wounds that take months or even a year 
and never heal because it the diabetes affects their ability to heal so dramatically. Genetic connective tissue disorders can also impair healing, such as Marfan syndrome and osteogenesis imperfecta, just to name a few. There are three basic types of tissue repair, primary intention, secondary intention, and tertiary intention. Healing or repair by primary intention involves the type of healing obtained when the edges of the wound are approximated or placed in contact with one another. This creates the best outcome and the smallest scar. Secondary intention involves an injury in which tissue is lost. Granulation tissue forms in the injured site. This results in more scarring. Tertiary intention involves a wound that could be a primary, but it is left open deliberately in order to let the wound drain. This occurs when there are many contaminants or infection or to keep the outer margins from healing before the deep sections inside heal in order to have a better result. Here we have an example of a wound that healed with primary intention. The edges are approximated and then sealed with a biologic glue. You can see the changes in the amount of swelling and erythema and redness over time. This slide shows you an example of a wound that healed with secondary intention. You can see that there was no way they could approximate or connect the edges of this wound. Tissue was lost and granulation tissue formed beneath this scab. Over time, repair and remodeling will continue and the wound will fully recover. However, I expect this person will have a scar. Lastly, today I wanted you to understand the difference between hyperplasia and hypertrophy as we move into the next section on inflammatory conditions found in the oral cavity. Hypertrophy occurs when each cell becomes larger. The number of cells does not change, but the cells are larger and therefore often the organ becomes larger. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, involves a huge increase in the number of cells. When dealing with chronic inflammatory conditions, many of these conditions will involve hyperplasia. In review, we've covered the inflammatory process, including local and systemic inflammation, the acute inflammatory process, the regeneration and repair process, as well as types of repair and the difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia. This concludes our brief review of inflammation and repair for today. Next up will be two videos that cover inflammation and repair in more detail and types of wound healing in more detail as well. This will be followed by a video on injuries to teeth and a PowerPoint that reviews oral inflammatory conditions for this chapter. This is Dr. Tracy Zhang with Oral Pathology for the dental hygienist.